I will now uh, move directly to um, the heart of our Click Cafe today, that is the rights of data subjects under the GDPR. Um, so before we dive in the rights of data subjects, I think I owe you a little bit of, uh, uh, of an introduction to the GDPR in general. Uh, as most of you know, uh, the GDPR uh, is uh, the acronym for the General Data Protection Regulation. Uh, it is a very ambitious uh, piece of EU legislation that governs uh, the processing of personal data in the European Union. It applies directly since May 25, uh, 2018, and it repealed uh, the Personal Data Directive from 1995. Um, what's important to keep in mind it, is that the, G, that the GDPR is a regulation, and as such, it indeed applies directly in the member states. So an individual uh, can rely directly on the provisions of the GDPR uh, without uh, the need to pass through uh, national laws which means that the protection is, uh, well, perhaps not completely unified, but uh, the rules applicable across the European Union are extremely similar from one uh, country to another. Uh, there might be some slight variations in certain areas, and unfortunately, one of these areas is research uh, and rise of data subjects uh, in the context of uh, research activities. Uh, and whenever we come to a point that might be regulated differently in your national law, we will let you know uh, so that uh, you know, so that you, you, you make, make sure to check uh, if it's the same in, in your national law. Um, personal data is defined as any information related to an identified or identifiable person, natural person. It is a very broad definition and it covers all sorts of uh, data that can be present in language resources. Um, and it's important to know that it's not only the directly identifying data, such as name and surname, place of birth, uh, social security number, uh, but it is indeed interpreted very, very broadly, and it covers uh, images, it covers um, all sorts of voice recordings, uh, interviews, surveys, uh, uh, answers to surveys um, from a person. So uh, it is quite likely that if you are dealing with language resources, there is, at least at some stage, there is uh, quite a lot of personal data in them. Um, now, what is processing? Processing is anything you do to data, including storage, including erasure. Uh, so whenever we touch upon data, it's, it can be referred to as processing, and therefore it is governed by the GDPR. Uh, the idea behind the GDPR is to grant data subjects control over their own data. It's clearly stated in recital seven of the GDPR. And the rights of data subjects are one of the focal points of the GDPR. And um, their, their purpose, uh, so to say, is to grant uh, natural persons a degree, at least a degree of control over how their personal data are being used and uh, processed and with whom they are shared, uh, et cetera. Um, most of you remember uh, two, three years ago when the GDPR uh, was entering into application. Um, there has been there has been quite there, there were quite a lot um, there was quite a lot of fuss uh, quite some fuss in the media uh, about the fact, and one of the main reasons uh, behind that is that uh, unlike in the Personal Data Directive and the GDPR, there is a possibility uh, to um, use quite hefty fines to discipline, uh, so to say, data controllers. So the fines for uh, violations of uh, data protection principles can go up to 20 million uh, euro. That's uh, a lot of money. Um, but don't worry, researchers are highly unlikely to be fined that much. Uh, 
but there have been fines against universities. There have been fines against um, university hospitals, mostly for security related uh, breaches. And uh, some of them were uh, quite substantial. So uh, it is still something to keep in mind when you are at university or in the academic, in the academia and the academic world. It doesn't make you immune uh, to the GDPR uh, fines in, in any way. Um, in this cafe, we have divided rise of data subjects into two categories. Uh, this is uh, a division we have made up for the purpose of this cafe. This is not something you will find elsewhere. Uh, but the idea behind this division is that uh, there are some rights uh, that can stop the processing. So if you are processing personal data and language resources and one of those rights is exercised, uh, then it may lead to uh, the obligation to stop the processing. Not necessarily delete the data, but uh, just, uh, um, well, you won't be able to reuse the language resource if there is um, a successful request uh, related to the exercise of certain rights of data subjects. And these rights, we call them restraining rights. And it's uh, withdrawal of consent, uh, the right of erasure, uh, commonly referred to as the right to be forgotten, the right to restriction of processing and the right to object. There is also a right that is theoretically restraining. There is the right of, uh, um, uh, free, let me call it freedom from, from automatic decision-making. But we will not discuss this right. This is the only right that is not, that is not included in our presentation because uh, we thought it's uh, not relevant for language resources, really. Uh, but if you think it is, uh, let us know during the discussion and we can, we can discuss the non-automated decision uh, making uh, with you. The other rights um, are at the same time more and less important. They are more important because uh, you are more likely to come across a request related to one of these rights. We call them non-restraining rights, and these rights are information access, rectification, and portability. Um, but at the same time, their purpose is not to prevent you from processing the data, but rather to provide the data subject with information or uh, some degree of control over his data without the possibility to make the processing stop. So this is uh, how we divided the rights of data subject subjects uh, for uh, the purposes of today's meeting. Uh, traditional disclaimer, take whatever we say with a grain of salt. Uh, the information that we provide is not uh, meant to be legal advice. Uh, we are not your lawyers, uh, we are your friends, and we can discuss uh, these issues uh, as we discuss with, with a friend. But it does not replace professional legal advice uh, that can be obtained from experts from your uh, specific jurisdiction. Um, you should also take whatever we say with a grain of salt, because the domain that we'll be talking about is constantly evolving. There is a list of guidelines from the EDPB uh, that is growing longer and longer every month, actually. Uh, and there is quite a lot of guidelines that are relevant for uh, today's subject. Uh, especially we are waiting, we are still waiting for uh, guidelines on certain rights of data subjects that are in development since January 2020 that can be published uh, well, in a day now. Uh, so it is possible that uh, these guidelines will uh, change certain, certain things that we'll mention today. So uh, once again, take whatever we say here with a grain of salt. We'll do uh, our best to provide you with quality information, uh, but um, um, please uh, consider it um, uh, help from a friend rather than uh, legal advice. 
some general information about uh, how the rights of data subjects work. Uh, now, the right of a data subject is actually a possibility to file a request. So the data subject can send you a request. Well, when I say you, I mean to the data controller, to the, 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 the person or entity who controls the data in the sense of the, the GDPR. And Esther will tell us more about who is the controller. It can be an individual researcher, it can be the university, it can be a group of institutions. Uh, but for the purpose of this slide, when I say you, I mean the controller. Uh, so the data subject has the right to send you a request. This request can be sent in writing or um, can be addressed to you uh, orally. Um, and uh, how should you process such a request? So first of all, that's very important in the GDPR, there is an obligation to facilitate the exercise of data subject rights, uh, which means that uh, data processors, you are obliged to adopt internal procedures to define uh, how uh, the request will be handled. Um, so what is the contact, who is the contact point? how uh, I imagine the contact point will consult someone uh, to know how to process the request. Uh, then you will answer the request within a certain deadline um, using a certain mean of communication. And all this um, should be defined in your uh, internal procedure. This is an obligation under the GDPR. Um, any communication with the data subject, so any answer to a request should use plain language that is understandable to the data subject. And this requirement is very interesting when it comes to language resources, uh, because it actually does not mean that you should use the, the, the official language of your country if uh, it concerns the speakers of a foreign language. Uh, then it would be more appropriate to communicate with the speakers of this foreign language in their language um, to the extent possible. So you should, rather than using the official language of your country in every case, uh, you, what should be your, your objective should be to provide plain and understandable information uh, to the data subjects. There is a deadline for answering requests uh, in, in the GDPR, and the deadline is uh, without undue delay, but in any case, uh, up to one month. Well, no more than one month, unless the request is complex, and uh, then the answer can take up to three months. But you have to explain uh, why, uh, you have to ex explain the reasons for the delay, so the complexity of, of the request. Um, it may happen that you have doubts about the identity of the data controller. So someone uh, sends you an email asking for access to uh, certain information, but you don't really know if it's really the person, uh, the data subject, uh, whom the data concern. So if you have reasonable doubt about the identity of the data subject, you can request additional information. Uh, whether you can or cannot request an ID card may vary from, uh, from uh, country to country, but um, the GDPR expressly states that you can request additional information to verify the identity of the person who uh, makes a request. You will see that there is uh, quite a lot of research exceptions. So quite a lot of these rights are, are limited in the context of research. And if such a research exception applies, you still have to respond to the request. It doesn't mean that you can ignore a request. If you receive a request, you still have to respond to it and explain why you don't act on that request. So you have to explain that there is an exception that you uh, consider as uh, applicable to your specific case. And uh, you also have to inform uh, the data subject about the possibility to lodge a complaint and to seek judicial remedy. Uh, so the answer is never uh, no, period. The answer is, well, we won't respond to your request because there is a research exception that applies to our case. And if you don't agree with this, um, you can uh, lodge a complaint with the National Data Protection uh, Authority. 
for for example, in uh, England, it's uh, the ICO, the um, Information Commissioner. And you can also seek judicial remedy, so you can sue us uh, to, to obtain this, this information. And uh, this is what a uh, such a negative response uh, should, uh, should include. If, however, requests are manifestly unfounded or excessive, you can either refuse uh, to act upon a request, you still have to respond, you just respond negatively, or you can respond positively and charge a reasonable fee. Uh, a request is manifestly unfounded if it is apparent that the, person, the person's true intention is to wreak havoc and to cause you troubles rather than um, truly uh, obtain the, the, the information that he or she requests. And requests are excessive if they are repetitive or if they overlap with uh, other requests, uh, to put it very shortly. Uh, okay, so this is all from me for now.